we are recording this so people that aren't able to make it tonight can watch it at a later date. And all right, 602, I'm going to go ahead and get this thing started. My name is JJ Gladden and I'm the Fishing Education Coordinator for Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. And we, like I just said, we've been doing these for coming on two years now and it's, it's been really successful and it would not be successful without a great panel of what I'm gonna call tonight experts. So congratulations to our panel. You are now at the expert level in kayak and paddle fishing. So you just got a promotion. So to kind of introduce our panel, we are gonna talk about what it is that drives us to fish. Why do we like to fish, but more specifically kayak or paddle fish? So I'm gonna call on Daryl Bowman first. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what, uh, what it is, why you like kayak fish. Thanks, JJ. Hi, I'm Daryl Bowman, uh, Assistant Chief of Fisheries Division here at Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Um, and uh, absolutely, uh, if there's anything I can do in my spare time, I wanna be on a creek and I wanna be in my canoe. Notice I said canoe. Um, we call this a kayak fishing seminar, but it's, it's all about human powered paddling craft fishing. And that's become extremely popular with kayaks, but uh, I'm still an open boater and prefer canoes. No reason for that, but the point is, it's just great to get on a flowing stream and enjoy it and catch some fish in the process. Um, and I love to do it for the, the solitude um, and uh, uh, just absolutely, that's how I like to, to experience nature. Um, and through the course of this evening, you're gonna hear a lot about kayak fishing. Just want you to keep in mind that uh, you can fish from a canoe and that has been the traditional way. The only difference is you use a double blade paddle with one and a single blade paddle with the other. There's, there's other differences, but that's the primary uh, thing. And uh, maneuvering a canoe with a single blade paddle is becoming a lost art. And I would challenge you to try it out and uh, see how you like it. There's some advantages, especially when it comes to fishing. And one of them is simply being able to lay your rod down in a comfortable position and not worry about it falling out of the boat or sticking up in the air. Um, so thanks for letting me be part of this, JJ, and uh, I look forward to this evening. Absolutely. Thanks, Daryl. And, and yeah, we are probably going to say kayak more than we say canoe, but a lot of these things are interchangeable. It's, it's the same general idea. There are advantages to one over the other, but in general speaking, you know, we're, we're talking about not being in a, you know, 18 foot bass boat or something like that. We're talking about being on the water in a vessel and it being mm -hmm. minimalist. It's basically tiny houses for fishing. So um, Eric, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what drives you? Uh, yeah, my name's Eric, uh, AKA Itching to Fish. Some might know me out there as that title. And uh, what drives me is just being out in mother nature and enjoying the scenery. I think we're blessed in Arkansas to have, you know, for example, everybody talks about the Buffalo National River, you know, it's so beautiful and scenic, but there's still a lot of rivers out there that people don't talk about that are just as scenic, like Kings River, Cajun Creek's got some beautiful bluff lines as well, and it's in our backyard, for Central Arkansas. So for me, it's the adventure. If a boat can get on the creek, I'm not there. I like it to be a paddle creek only, basically, and uh, you know, just me and Mother Nature, the trees, the water, the waterfalls in the background. You know, that's what I live for, live in the current. And uh, so I love fishing. Uh, I started out as a kayaker, and then I was like, well, why don't I have a rod in my hand? So I started fishing a few years later after kayaking, and uh, once I got that hook set. And that sleigh ride began, I was hooked, no pun intended. I mean, it was a blast, especially with those big old smallmouth on these creeks like Crooked Creek and all that. I mean, just going downstream with the, you know, big fish on your line and it's just pulling you around in circles and stuff. That was an awesome experience. So for me, you know, I work Monday through Thursday and then my off day, I probably should be sharing this is Friday. 
And I just love to use that day, just kind of unwind, go out in nature, and uh, just enjoy the scenic and everything that Arkansas has to offer. So I, I look for a current and rapids. Um, I love rapids. I just did a class two the other day. And, you know, I love fishing, but the half of the adventure is the adventure itself, you know, just getting all that fun stuff and going around these big boulders as well. So. Perfect. Thank you, Eric. Karen, how about you? Sure, I'll start out introducing myself. So I'm Karen Westcamp Johnson. I also work for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Um, I'm an educator, a regional educator, kind of in West Central Arkansas, and uh, get to do a lot of fun things um, with my with my job as a as an educator. A lot of it involves kayak and fishing, but for me, you know, kayak fishing is my escape. Um, that's, I mean, whether you are talking fishing or you're talking kayaking or anything to do with the water, that's my chance to just get away and have a break. And when you put those two together, which is what we're talking about tonight, then I'm in like, you know, heaven. Um, but I always call any time getting on the water as my water therapy or being by it. And so um, we'll, we'll get into a lot more of, of stuff related to that tonight. But that's me. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Mark, how about you? Hey guys, my name is Mark Dyer. I work for JJ in fishing education. I'm one of the technicians there. Uh, my my uh, start on the water, I guess, was spending a whole lot of time on the Spring River uh, canoeing in high school and in college. Uh, did just a little bit of fishing on there. Uh, we started, after I got married, my wife and I started making a whole lot of trips to the Buffalo River. And uh, I never really thought about combining the two until I... Uh, Saw a guy catch a good size smallmouth as we passed by one day. Haven't been without a rod. Haven't been up there without a rod since. Uh, I've expanded from just going to Buffalo to Crooked Creek, Caddo River, just as many different uh, small rivers as I can find. Um, kind of a lot like the uh, some of the other guys that are speaking. Uh, if a big boat can go there, I'd prefer not to be there. Uh, I want I want to be on moving water. And, you know, I love catching kind of unique fish with uh, those Ozark bass and some of the some of the different things out there. Uh, but it's one of my newer passions. I've been doing it about four years now and just uh, it, it gets you hooked. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, and there's just there's just something about it. You know, there's so many advantages to paddle fishing. I'll say paddle fishing instead of just kayak but you can you can get to places that other people can't get to it doesn't cost an arm and a leg to to get out there so if i mean you can portage one like if if you're going to a place say you're down in east arkansas and you know you run up on a, a beaver dam or something like that it's a lot easier to pull that kayak across than it is to uh, to pull a big flat bottom across or something like that you know you can get into one for around a thousand or under. I mean, it doesn't have to be an expensive situation. Uh, right now, there's probably a bunch of used ones out there because you couldn't find a kayak in the last two years. Maybe somebody's tired of it by now, by now and you can pick up a, uh, a cheap one on a, you know, a yard sale or whatever a virtual yard sale is. I don't even know. But honestly, I, I mean, I just think that it's a lot of fun. It's, it's getting out there and just you know, whether you're with a group of people, whether you're doing an escape from, from the hustle and bustle of everything, you just get to get out there, have fun, whether, you know, I like going out with friends and family, like that's, that's what really uh, gets me going is like, I may escape some people from work, stuff like that, but you, you get out there with the, the people that you care about and, and you just have a good time. So I appreciate all the answers and hopefully that uh, helps our, our audience tonight see a little bit into why we're here and why we, we wanted to share our experience with everybody. So we talked a little bit about this. Let's take it a little bit deeper and I'll go right back to Mark. Um, Mark, what is one of your favorite locations and target species? Ooh. I would have to say my, my favorite location is, is still going to be the Buffalo River because that's where I started. Um, I've got lots of different areas there that I've just fished a lot more than I have other places. 
and I've got there's just areas there where I I know I can find a way to be successful, and that's you know I caught my first I, I caught my first big smallmouth there, uh, and and that one was actually I got out of the boat and was wade fishing doing that, and that's that's one of my favorite things about if you need to. You, know, you don't always have to fish out of the boat. You can port it, you know, you can you can put it on the bank real quick and go out and start wading and really fish that water. And I know we're not doing a wade fishing class tonight, but it's it's one of the things that's great about being in a small craft. Uh, you can you can uh, get that thing on the side and get over there and and really work some water. And the thing I like about a kayak versus when I was fishing out of a canoe, it's a lot easier. It's a little bit more maneuverable to reposition yourself. Uh, it doesn't require quite as much paddling skill. Uh, I will give I will give Daryl props on that because that is a, that is a, like he said that is a lost art. So, uh, but definitely Buffalo River is my my favorite place hands down. Uh, Eric, what about you? I'm not sure I'm going to tell you the takeout spot, but uh, <laughs> one of my favorite um, recent discoveries was uh, Crooked Creek. And it's just a blue ribbon smallmouth fishery up there near Yellowville, Arkansas. And, you know, if y'all don't even have a kayak just yet, you can go up there. There's plenty of spots, you know, Game and Fish is set up just for, you know, wade fishing, just walking downstream, upstream and working some good holes. And near that Fred Berry, I believe it's the Fred Berry Conservation Center. All that area is catch and release only. And there's some hogs in there, you know what I'm saying? So um, one of my favorites is smallmouth fishing and Crooked Creek is one of those. I will say the more north you go, the bigger the girls are. So the fish girls that is. So, um, so anyways, I really love catching brownies, smallies, small jaws, whatever you want to call them. But um, one of my, it's a small PB, but I've just been smallmouth fishing for the last two years. And it's a three pounder came off that creek. And it was in a section that is, you know, highly, uh, probably a lot of people go through that section, just to give you a little hint. And it was just a football. It came out. I thought it was an obese fish, you know. I didn't know what was going on with it, but it was just a huge football. It wasn't very long, but, man, that thing fought and fought. I caught it on a little Helgramite by Nico. So um, it's just a great, you know, put it on a Ned rig and just drag it through those deep holes, and you can get a lot of different species on that setup but those smallmouth just love Helgramites. So, but yeah, that's one of my favorite fisheries and that's the one I try to get up to and kind of break it down. There's so many sections on it, you know, starting from Harrison and working way down. Awesome, thank you. Karen, how about you? Yeah, so I'll kind of talk about two type of locations because I do both moving water um, and flat water. Um, fishing and kayaking. And so if you're in, you know, from anywhere in the state, especially West Central Arkansas, where I'm at, you really can't talk about moving water without mentioning the Mulberry River. Um, and that's basically what I, you know, kind of grew up and in, in, in the entire life has kind of been floating. But I'm one of those that I actually, if I'm on moving water, I'm on the Mulberry, I prefer to float the lower Mulberry as opposed to the upper because the upper Mulberry is where everybody's at because that's where the rapids are at and that's where all the, the people go. Um, and I actually like staying on the lower Mulberry. Um, that's just my personal preference. And that's partially to get away from people because remember mine is escape. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, and I mean, it, really over here across I mean, anywhere in the state, but I mean, I've, you know, even the small Fouche Le Fay or up North Kings River, those are some of my favorites just to sneak off to, but the absolute favorite is, is the mulberry. Um, but I do probably just as much uh, what I call flat water fishing now and um, even teaching people on flat water. And so that's just lakes, little lakes that my favorite are those that you can't get a motorboat on or you're not allowed to put a motor more that's 10 more, more than 20, 10 horsepower on. Um, and so like locally Greenwood Lake, um, you know, in Sebastian County is, is definitely one of my favorites. Um, also the old Boonville City Lake, there's a lot of little lakes like that, that I love to, to take the kayak and just get on. And, and those are two totally different skills. And when we get into some of the safety stuff I'll talk about later, I'll, I'll definitely talk about some of the differences between the two. But there's folks on here who aren't necessarily into all that super fast moving water. I want you to know that flat water kayak fishing is just as, as big of a deal and just as much fun as the moving water. So. Oh, and, and for me, I honestly don't care about species. I just want something to bite the hook and I'm happy. I mean, even bluegill, those that were hitting so fast and quick, they're some of my favorites as well. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. That's, that's a good point. Uh, Daryl, how about you? 
Yeah, um, sure. I could, like any of us, I, I could, we could take up the next three hours and where I like to go fish and what I like to fish for. Um, and in the interest of brevity, uh, so my favorite animal in the whole world is the smallmouth bass. I did my master's degree work on a project uh, on smallmouth bass and Beaver Lake and the tributaries. Um, and I've spent most of my life floating streams catching smallmouth bass. But one thing I really love about fishing rivers is, as Eric pointed out, depending on the rig you use, I like to use really small things because I like for all the fish in the river to have the opportunity to get on my hook because there's so many neat species of sunfish and uh, others, depending on where you're at, um, pickerel species. There's just a lot of fun to be had if you'll throw something out there that anything might bite, uh, even if it has a smaller mouth. Long ear sunfish are the, the prettiest fish on the planet um, and can be caught in a lot of our streams, for instance. Um, uh, war mouth, uh, Ozark bass, shadow bass, so on. Um, so I love all those um, species. Um, like Karen said, uh, I'll give a, a moving water example of a, a creek that goes unnoticed a lot. And that's the Illinois River up in Northwest Arkansas. Not to be confused with the Illinois Bayou that's down by Karen, down by Russellville, which is my, one of my favorite whitewater streams. Also a great uh, fishing stream, but uh, the Illinois River in Northwest Arkansas is sort of a hidden gem Everybody seems to bypass it and go to the Buffalo or the Kings or or uh, or uh, the Mulberry, um, but that's a great bass fishery. And our fisheries biologist data shows, and if you fish it, it's probably the best spotted bass uh, river fishery. It's one of the best in the state. There are smallmouth there, and when you get over on the Oklahoma side, you actually get into more smallmouth. But um, for various reasons, the spotted bass fishery on the Arkansas side of the Illinois River is really impressive and a lot of fun. And it's an easy float stream. It's, there's really no hazards. You might encounter a tree in the creek every now and then that, that'll become a strainer. Um, and then move to the other side of the state. Um, like Karen said, flat water can be really fun and that can be defined as all of our lowland streams like Bio de View, which is going through the big woods of Eastern Arkansas. Uh, it's a place where a lot of people don't even know it exists. Um, and it's just an outstanding and unique opportunity to float through uh, what looks like a swamp to most people, cypress trees and tupelo trees. Um, that's where we thought we found the ivory bill woodpecker uh, a, a decade or so ago. Um, it's, a, it's a true wilderness area in the middle of the Mississippi Delta, and it's a unique experience. And again, fishing wise, uh, there's no telling what might jump on your hook down there. Um, lots, of, lots of interesting fish. So uh, that's just a couple of examples of, of what I like. Like Eric said, I, I, I like to go from one end of the state to the other and encounter every environment I can and, and every river I can. Um, it's, there's just so much in Arkansas to offer. Thanks, Daryl. You know, and I think that that's a really good point is when you have when you're fishing in a small craft like this, when you're kayak or, or canoe fishing, you have that. It's a lot easier to travel the state and do things like that. You know, you're not dragging a boat trailer, all those things. You know, you can just be like, all right, you wake up one morning or hopefully you plan the night before. But, you know, you do you. And it's like, yeah, I want to go to Crooked Creek. And the next day, you may want to go to Southwest Arkansas. Um, my favorite on moving water, I'm going to have to say, is the Caddo River. Um, that's where I grew up. And that's just, you know, that is where I got my start fishing. So besides a few creeks and uh, stuff like that around the house, like the Caddo River was four miles away. So that's where I was. And that's where I like to be. Of course, I like to be there this time of year before it gets too touristy. Um, and I mean, that's when the fish are going to be biting. So um, that's definitely my favorite on the moving water. And I'm glad that Daryl went East Arkansas on his, uh, on his flat water. You know, there's some other options out there, like any of our WMAs or even the, the White River Refuge Lakes, like you can pop around on those and, and do some really good fishing out there. And uh, trying to get a boat in them is just 
ridiculous. But if you're if you're paddle fishing, you can you can really get out there and have some fun and and on the refuge or somewhere like that. So just a ton of options. I mean, we've got so much water in this state that we really have no excuse for not getting out there. So, uh, I, sir. Uh, just to make a quick point, as this discussion goes on, we'll, we'll probably go there with a few different creeks, but like the Caddo, um, it's, a, it's a good example of how you brought up uh, the touristy aspect. There are sections of the Caddo River that are extremely busy with folks that aren't necessarily interested in fishing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at that very same time, you can usually go upstream, right? And yep. even a small river and the outfitters don't operate and you can do some high quality fishing and have the river to yourself. So the point being on any of these creeks we talk about, if you if folks on the, uh, if the audience here has heard that maybe that creek is overrun with people or it's a party river, every one of these creeks have places you can get to where everybody else is not going. You just got to do your homework and, and look around. So I wouldn't let that be a deterrent. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't going to give away too many secrets. You're fixing to give away my put in or something. I still didn't say any specific put in, right? Okay. Eric, okay. Eric, we're, we're safe, right? We're good. We're good. Um, <laughs> so let's move into, you know, we, when we're teaching things like fishing out of a small craft like this, we want people to have the experience in paddling before we get on, like, we don't need you to try to be balancing a fishing pole and your, your uh, paddle and all that back and forth. Like, we really want people to be safe and we want them to have some uh, paddling experience before we put that rod in their hand. So I'm gonna ask Karen to talk a little bit about paddling safety and concerns for us real fast. Yeah, and I'll try to make it quick. I have I have a lot of stuff we could do, but I'll make it quick. Um, so you know, one of the reasons that I'm going to talk about this is like this is this is kind of one of my passions is, is kayak safety. Um, and I actually do classes for everything from from little tiny ones to adults on kayak skills. Um, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. And um, so I'm just going to hit a couple of the main things that we have to be aware of. And I don't want to like, you know, necessarily scare people or whatever, but I want us to be aware of safety. So as we're kind of getting into this, if you guys don't mind in the chat box, just to put um, a comment of whether you are lake or moving water like stream fishing, river or lake when you put your kayak, it, it'll give me an idea. So just lake or river um, is where more people are going kind of to focus on. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about very briefly is a float plan. So I know that a lot of times if we are going to be, um, I've seen a lot of people commenting like, this is what I need to know. Um, good. So um, if we are going to be, you know, fishing out of a boat, a lot of times we think of ourselves as a fisherman and not a boater. Um, but you are both, okay? Um, you're a boater and a fisher. And so all those regulations and all those safety concerns with boats need to apply in addition to um, your fishing stuff. So the first thing is a float plan. And you guys may or may not have heard about float plans, but uh, big thing is that you want to tell somebody where you're going and you want to tell them when to expect you back. And especially if you're going to be um, on a big body of water, like if I'm saying, hey, I'm going to go fish the Mulberry River today. And if I told my husband that, do you think he'd have any idea on where that river to have somebody come and get me if I didn't tell him where I was going? There's probably, you know, six or seven different places you can put in and take out. So always tell somebody where you're going to go when you're expected to come back and your exact spot. Um, and we, you know, that'll be my first thing. Second thing, guys, um, and I'm seeing a lot of folks on lakes, so, so I'll, I'll focus on that in just a minute, is life jackets. Um, and I brought one to show you guys right now briefly um, with me. But most people also don't think about life jackets as much if you're a fisherman. Um, but my goodness, on a kayak, canoe, and especially if you've got a rod or reel in your hand, you know, and you're going to be moving around, life jackets are vital. So it's actually mandatory. It's a, it's a law that we actually have to have a life jacket on board or a personal flotation device on board your vessel that includes a canoe or kayak if you're going to be on the bottom, if it's going to be on the body of water. So whether you are just literally sitting on that and you're just paddling in that little pool and you're not even going 30 yards, if you are using a paddle as a way to propel yourself, you have to have a life jacket on board. I ask everybody to wear their life jacket. Um, this is what we, I mean, I teach kiddos how to float in them properly on water. It's not going to do any good if all you do is um, have it sitting there as a back rest on your boat. 
And so I, I'm going to show you guys a couple of things about this one is this is actually a paddling life jacket. Um, and I recommend it for canoe and kayaking because it does have the space for your arms for paddling. Um, I'll set it aside for a second here. So they make a million different kinds of life jackets. Um, and if you just go buy those super cheap orange ones at Walmart that you can get a pack of like four for like 10 bucks or 20 bucks, you're not going to wear it when you're on the water. And guys, it's going to do you no good if you're not wearing your life jacket, okay? Um, and so I honestly think I own personally six different life jackets for different scenarios that I'm in. And um, the two I use the most is this one right here, which is my, my paddling one that I use when I'm canoeing and kayaking. The other one that I, I use a lot, which you guys don't necessarily, but it's my Swift Water Rescue Vest. Um, so, you know, as a Game and Fish employee who does a lot of water stuff, I've been through swift water training and I've been through kayak instructor training and paddleboard training. And the more you get into these things, the more you realize you want to um, be extra prepared. And so another thing I'll mention is, which JJ kind of did, um, was making sure you have the right skills. And so, you know, we, we offer some classes, Game and Fish does, kind of for free, but we're talking like a two, three hour class on paddling. If you're really wanting to get into learning those paddling skills, the Arkansas Canoe um, Association, Arkansas Canoe Club, however you want to put it, Arkansas Canoe Club um, has classes. And usually it's May and June that they do them on the Mulberry, and you can pick from flat water to white water classes. You have to pay for it, but they're great classes as well. Um, and so anyways, that's another thing to mention. So so just what I've talked about so far, guys, follow float plan, wear the proper life jackets, have the right skills. Um, but let me go over a couple of other things <laughs> before we move on. There's a lot of you guys on lakes, and I'll focus on that in just a minute. Um, but some of y'all do move on moving water, talk about uh, floating and all the moving water. And so, you know, there's always things to be aware of on moving water and, and I'm assuming if you guys are you know at all on rivers and creeks and stuff like that you know the basics but you always want to watch out for strainers which I heard somebody mention earlier and you want to watch out for rapids and we say rapids and everybody's like that's the cool stuff that's what I want to, I want to hit and it is um but you have to know how to approach a rapid uh and that's kind of approaching the v part of the water as it moves so that you stay with the current um so that you don't get your boat sideways or tumble or any of that stuff um but strainers are the big thing and um probably at some point jg is going to put up in the chat some links we might not do them all right now but our game oh he's saying we might do them all right now our game and fish virtual nature center has a ton of safety videos that that i actually made i think two years ago with some of our wildlife officers on safety in water. And I think there's like six different ones. Um, and, it, and, you know, we talk about how to get out of strainers, how to avoid strainers, how to float downstream. Um, we could spend all day on that, but I want to make sure you guys know those resources are out there. So if you were on moving water, it's vital if you roll your boat, which is going to happen. Okay. When I do kayak classes with people, it's one of the first things I make them do is roll their boat, just so you know what it feels like to fall out and get back in. But you want to float on your back with your feet facing up, and your feet downstream. So what I always tell kids and, and adults both is I'd rather my feet be hitting those rocks first before my head. So that's why you want your, your feet downstream. And I want my feet up because if my feet are down in that fast moving current, it's really easy for my feet to get stuck on rocks and root balls. And then I could fall face forward or get sucked under. And so I always tell people to feet up and float on your back. Um, so that's just a couple of things with that. Uh, I will mention, I'm trying to make this quick so we can get into the fishing stuff, which we want. <laughs> um, this is this is kind of my soapbox. I will also mention, guys, that if you are on any body of water in Arkansas in a swampable or tippable boat, which is a canoe kayak raft, actually legally required that you have all of your items secured and that you carry a trash bag or a mesh bag, um, which is one I've got kind of here for your trash or that you have it in a locked container. So that could be your ice chest with the lock, or that could be um, one of my favorite things is I actually have a lunch pail that zips closed and I carabiner everything to the boat. And most people don't know that or realize that and you also cannot have glass. Um, so if you're in a canoe or kayak or any swampable, tippable one, you have to have those. Now is your law enforcement gonna write your ticket on a flat body of water like Greenwood Lake for not having it? Probably not. But those high areas like the Mulberry River or the Buffalo where there's a ton of traffic, 
and it's easy for the stuff to get lost or float or break and cause damage, um, they will. So, so if you guys have questions about any of that, don't hesitate to put it in the chat in a little bit. Um, and I could literally spend all night on this, but I do want to point out one more thing since we have a ton of lake fisher folks in here. A new thing that I've started doing, um, because I, like I said, I teach a lot of canoe kayak things, and part of it is, is teaching people how to reboard their boat in a lake. Um, you know, if we're in a stream or a creek, it's really easy. Just push it to the side, hop back in. But if you're in a big body of water like a lake where you don't have easy access to get to the shore and you're, you're over your head, it's really hard to reboard your boat. Um, so it's vital that you have a boat that you know you can reboard. And if you can't, because not all of us are like these strong, like the gentlemen that are on here, <laughs> and there's not a lot of upper body strength, you have to rely on your core strength. Um, and, and if you if you happen to tip in cold water or you happen to tip and you kind of panic or you know, you're like me and you have asthma and it's really easy, easy to get out of air, it's hard to get back in, they make, um, you can buy rescue steps, okay, online. You can buy straps just like this, which I carry now on my boat online that are designed to go around the cockpit and you just hang off and it has a spot to put your foot in. Or what I'm, before I even bought all those, which I now use in classes, is literally just webbing, okay? And I got this for free um, just by going to one of the hardware stores and asking for webbing, tied a knot in it, and I can literally have somebody stand in it and use it as an extra rope to get into a boat. So um, that's just a couple of things to point out to you guys if you're gonna be in those big bodies of water. Um, so I'll kind of wrap it on that. So remember, follow float plan, life jacket, okay? Um, and be familiar with what type of floating, whether it's river or lake. And now I want to get into the fun stuff rather than the, the stuff we're like, oh man, maybe we really want to go now. But seriously, guys, if y'all have questions, put them in the chat. Um, and also, uh, you know, keep in mind as the summer approaches, if you're anywhere in kind of West Central Arkansas, I mean, I will be offering some more of these free classes about basic boating skills and how to reboard and that kind of stuff. So don't hesitate to, to ask about that as well. So sorry, JJ, I'll hog everything up. All right. Sorry, uh, that's really good information. And honestly, like we talk about the fishing, me and the fun stuff, but it's no fun if you don't have those basic skills. Like it's going to ruin your entire outing and it may turn you off from ever trying this again. So those basic skills are vital to the success of being a, a kayak angler. So thank you very much. We threw a lot of links in the chat there. We will be doing a follow-up email probably. It'll be this week. I'm not gonna say tomorrow. I'm not gonna pigeonhole us like that, but we'll put these links in there and our contact information. So if you need anything from us, if, if you wanna you know, contact Karen about some classes, things like that, we're more than happy to help. That's why we're here. So to get into the fun stuff, like Karen's talking about, um, I'm gonna ask Mark to talk a little bit about like some of the gear, like do you want a 20 foot jig pole in a, uh, in a kayak, stuff like that. So rods and reels and just some basic equipment if you would, Mark. Okay. Uh, well, guys, I want to just expand on what Karen was talking about just a little bit first. You know, when, when we're talking about being on certain water bodies, I mean, those of us that fish the, you know, the moving water in a small creek, you know, that's one thing. Another thing I know we've noticed with so many flat water lake anglers out there, a lot of you guys have mentioned some big water bodies. We don't show up as well as we think we do. We really do not. I mean, the flags, the light, the safety lights, all that stuff needs to be, I mean, if you've got the 300, you know, 360 degree safety lights, make sure those things stay charged, make sure they're good and bright. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there on the water that uh, are not, you know, people that are, that have been boating for years that are just not used to a lot of us being out there yet. And, you know, these guys that are fishing tournaments, the people that are out pleasure boating and whatever, we just need to be as visible as possible. So take into consideration what you have on, keep those PFDs on, make sure you got your flags or your lights or whatever up just uh, from basics for basic safety. I mean, and I, and I won't spend too much time on that because, you know, one of the things that JJ mentioned, I'm a big jig pole fisherman. You cannot fish a jig pole <laughs> out of a kayak very well that I found. Uh, I've 
I'll never forget the first time I got a couple of new really high tech jig poles and said, man, I'm going to get these in my kayak. It's just not the same. It's not the same as fishing out of a flat bottom unless you've got a, unless you've got the type of craft where you can actually stand. Um, I'm six, four. I don't stand in a kayak very well. That's awful lot of, and I'm a big guy. So it's an awful lot of weight to have up, up there in the air. So, uh, when I kayak fish versus when I fish out of my boat, my equipment changes. I start going a little shorter rod lengths. Uh, I don't throw a whole lot of bait casters out of my, out of my, out of my kayak just simply because most of the time I'm, I'm running a spinning tackle on, uh, on, uh, moving type of water. But I mean, just can, you know, a lot of the different things to consider, uh, since I fish a lot of moving water, I look it into your rod storage. Are you, are you running your rods vertical? Uh, I don't do that. A lot of times with me, that means my rods are, uh, I can't get, I keep them out of the trees. Uh, I use, uh, actually I've got it. I don't know if I can get a decent shot of it. I'll use a, like a Scotty style mount on one side of the boat and I will keep it, uh, the rod flush with the front of the boat sticking out. So as long as I'm not hitting a rock with the front of the boat, my other rod is usually safe and I can work fish around it and uh, do whatever. Um, are you keeping your fish or are you turning them all back? I mean, I'm not one that fishes for practice a whole lot. I like to eat these things. So when you start doing that, hey, are you, you know, are you in flat water and you're dragging a stringer or do you, do you have something on board, some type of live well cooler type setup uh, in order for you to keep the fish that you want to keep? I mean, when we start thinking about, when I start thinking about equipment, um, you know, some people don't mind having their, uh, drinks and their fish in the same cooler. Uh, I'm one of those people. Some of you guys may not be one of those people. Uh, in which case, you know, you make your, make your provisions for what you need. Consider your time when you're going out on the water. Um, you know, what do you need for the day for your float trip? Uh, I know that's a, that's a lot of thing as part of the adventure of it. Um, sometimes I, I, I think Eric does this. Um, I mean, a lot of times I'll overnight and you start talking about getting into dry bags, keeping your gear. Uh, a lot of times I'll hammock camp in that situation just because it's less gear to take. But anytime we start talking about the amount of stuff we're putting on our boat, we always have to look at the weight of it, uh, what type of water body we're on, whether we're going to, uh, you know, have what degree of control do you have uh when i fish flat water one of the things i don't know if any, anybody else uses one uh salesman got a hold of me so i own a sculling paddle uh that i can keep that i i'm I, I use a really long paddle when i kayak fish and i can keep that sucker deployed and i have a small sculling paddle that i keep tethered to the boat that uh, i keep in flat water i can keep my boat right uh, that way I can keep uh, fishing forward instead of uh, a lot of times the way I do in current fishing where you have to be a little bit more flexible with maybe how you fight a fish. He may be behind you, beside you, in front of you again, and uh, then in and among everything else. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen a whole lot of questions on gear come up in the chat. So anywhere, anywhere you guys can lead me, I will be happy to answer as many questions as I can. Um, but rod wise, I don't know anybody that wants to chime in along with me, Daryl, Eric, JJ. I mean, I, I try and keep my rod when I'm fishing a little shorter. Uh, and I don't take those big long rods when I'm in the boat. It's just, it just, uh they're too hard they're too hard to catch on too much stuff yeah you you hit on it mark uh the length of the rod is really important best to stay with five five and a half footers on the creek um rods that break down into two or more parts are really handy for getting your gear around and sometimes that's handy on the creek to be able to break a rod down um depending on if you get into situations where you've got a portage around a strainer or something like that um, and spinning reels and spinning rods and reels, uh, I think are 
much more popular, uh, interested, I'm sure Eric will chime in for one. Um, like you said, bait casters, I don't really do them well on the creek. It's just, uh, just not quite the right rig. I've seen people do it, but I'm not one of them. And I really love the spinning rigs. Um, five foot rod, ultralight and light action spinning rigs is, is my go-to. I've got several of them. And again, if I'm in a canoe, I can have three or four rods rigged up um, and still be able to get them out of the way where they're not hanging up on tree branches or anything else. And you brought up a great point with uh, overnighting. I love river tripping and uh, overnighting. And once again, the canoe is way handy for that because I've got the volume to store the gear. Um, so you can definitely get the gear there. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. There um, I appreciate that. We're going to go ahead. Uh, if y'all have questions about gear, go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll have time at the end for Q&A. But uh, let's have Daryl talk a little bit about what you're looking for when you're fishing, like reading the water type. Sure. This will be a great time to uh, actually share screen and bring up uh, diagrams of a, of a river, but we won't go there. Um, everybody here can envision it. Um, uh, Oh, let me just add this to the, the paddle craft discussion. One thing we haven't talked about is inflatables. If you look and pay attention, especially on the whitewater streams, even for fishing, people are going more and more to inflatables. Small rafts are becoming really versatile. There's a lot to offer, and a lot of them are in fishing platforms. And uh, at, uh, at my age, uh, after a lifetime of paddling and shoulder issues and everything else, uh, I'm finding that uh, I've got an inflatable kayak and an inflatable raft, and both of which are a sheer joy uh, to, to work out of. So just keep that in mind. But on, the, on, the, on a lake or a river, I think we all know as, as anglers, and for those of you who are beginning anglers, you're really looking for structure, or you know, we'll refer to it as fish habitat, but it's some form of structure. And on a river, that can even be just breaks in the current velocity. So for instance, floating down a stream, like Karen said, in, in navigating, um, you're doing certain things to stay in a certain part of the river. Well, for fishing, you're also looking for and taking advantage of current breaks. So for instance, Karen mentioned, you wanna keep your boat in the downstream V when you're in a uh, swift water situation. Well, on either side of that downstream V shape in the current are what we call eddies. And eddies is where the water is actually flowing back upstream in the reverse direction. And there's a very distinct line between the downstream current and the eddy upstream current. And that's a place where fish like to lay and feed. So um, that is structure to a fish is that, that current break. So in a river, um, I think Mark and Eric both maybe mentioned uh, when you're moving and the gear you've got, uh, if, you're, if the water's flat, like Eric was saying, you can handle your boat around with a sculling paddle, your paddle, get stationary and fish from the boat. There's a lot of situations your best fishing is to pull the boat over, hop out. And if you've got an area that's got really good current breaks, a lot of, a lot of boulders in the water, maybe some trees or things like that, you hop out of the boat, stand on the bank or wade and fish that structure really hard and make a lot of casts into every part of it. Um, but that's really, it's, it's really simple. Um, just wide open water where you see any structure, you'll catch fish there, but if you look for where you can see structure, um, you're gonna be much more likely to fish that structure and, and catch fish. And uh, again, all types of fish. Um, it's really just that simple. We could, we could get into a lot of detail with that discussion, but without diagrams or something, I'm not sure how to do it any better than that. And I would welcome any, any Eric or any, Karen or anybody to elaborate on that. You know, first thing I look for when fishing, especially creeks and rivers, is, uh, you know, normally they're not that wide. I mean, there's some big wide rivers out there. But, you know, the first thing that visual structure is a tree laying down in the water. You know, I'm going to cast there, spend some time there dissecting it. I'll work with the moving bait first. If I'm in my kayak, no luck there. Maybe I floated down 20 yards. I might get out or paddle back upstream depending on the eddy, you know, the current break. 
and you know drag something slow through there just see if i can get something out of there of course you know big rocks boulders you can tell where the rapids are uh one thing i look for a lot like you already mentioned daryl is that current break as you'll see that i mean it's pretty uh defined in the river where you see the current moving and then there's like a little line to the right or the left of that where that water slacks kind of slower maybe you'll see a little bubble trail going in that you know and so I'll look for those breaks. I'll actually cast like a spinner bait or a crank bait up into that current, not telling secrets out there, but now I'll pull it back through that line. And usually that's, like you said, they're looking up, feeding in that line. You know, trout, they look upstream when they're feeding. A lot of fish do that. So I'll pull it across that current break and usually I get smacked pretty hard right in there. So spinner baits are great for those current breaks. They don't get hung up, you know, a lot. And, uh, and that's a great bait to work around those rapids, the shoals, and pulling through that slack water for sure. So, uh, with rods, real quick, uh, you know, I do use a seven foot for my heavy stuff. You know, I went out with a friend a couple weeks ago on the Cadron, and you know, I had the hot bait on. I was throwing a spinner bait. It was a, I think it was a half ounce or something like that, three eighths. And, you know, I was just ripping, you know, lips all day. And he's like, dude, what are you using? I was like, here, I got an extra. He threw it on his light spinning rod. And the spinning rod was bent like that. And, you know, when he was trying to reel it in and stuff like that. So I like throwing heavy applications as well. But most time, like you said, Daryl, I'll throw, you know, a 610, 6'6 um, spinning rod with maybe eight to uh, six pound line on there and just dragging around those um, big holes and stuff like that. Just to mention my rod setup real quick. Eric's bass fishing on the creeks, man. He's yeah, he is here. Uh, you know, Eric. <laughs> yeah. Um, Eric, why don't you go ahead uh, and talk about moving equipment around? Uh, I think that's a, a question I saw come up in the chat as well. You know, like if you're trying to get to different places, like I'll let you tell it. You got this. Well, um, I'll start out with moving equipment, just your kayak itself or your poles, your paddle and all that. And something to keep in mind, like Daryl uses those shorter, you know, rods, is if you're in a two-door car throwing a kayak on top, it's going to be hard throwing a seven-foot, seven-six, you know, rod in that car or your paddle. So make sure you look for a paddle. Most of your paddles come apart, you know, so that's going to save on space. But, you know, just pay attention to, you know, what type of vehicle you're using, you know, and your rod size, your paddle length and all that. But um, with that said, I've actually car topped. I've used bed extenders on my truck and then I have a trailer currently. I've used all different applications um, when hauling my kayak and car top is fun. Let me just say um, I uh, made the mistake one time and got a 150 pound kayak and started car topping it. And I learned real fast that that's not the best route to go. So um, I worked at Children's Hospital for 10 years. So I had like a commuter car and that's what I used for everything. I'd take it down dirt roads on Kings and hit big old potholes, my bumper would be dangling, but you know, I got down to that fishing hole. But anyways, car topping, something really inexpensive to purchase and you can get them anywhere. You can actually get them used is if you're taking notes, look for a C to summit um, kayak slash paddleboard pad set. Now, what it is is just a thick two inch pad and it comes with two of them. So you put it on the front of your kayak and then back and it sits between your kayak or canoe. Um, you know, it puts a padding between your kayak or canoe between it and the car. So don't scratch your roof or anything like that. And all it is, you run the straps. It comes with a strap on each side and you run it through the doors of your car and you, uh, you know, tighten it down. That was probably my favorite car topping system. Um, really inexpensive, it was less than $100. Um, I actually sold them. I used them for three years and the D loops were still strong, well built. It's called C to Summit and it's just kayak pads basically. And they're pretty wide too. I had a 33 inch kayak on top of them. I still had plenty of space for it. So um, those are really, really great. And then you can just pull them off real quick and stow them. You don't have to leave it up there all times like you would like a rack system. Now, I did put a rack system on that um, car as well with the J bars. They look like little J's going down the highway. You've probably seen them. 
I, I might have been the uh, you know first person with those in Arkansas. I got so many weird looks. Like, what is that dude hauling on those hooks? It was something I found on Pinterest. We didn't have YouTube back in the day. I went on Pinterest for ideas for kayak stuff and all that. And uh, so those J hooks are great, but if you have like a pontoon hull design, then they're going to wobble in that. So those J bars are great for round bottom canoes, kayak stuff like that, which a lot of your canoes are round bottom. They're probably not wide enough for a canoe though. But uh, the thing with the rack system though is I highly recommend finding two parallel bar racks that has a safety strap that goes from one end through your car to the other side. I had a hard lesson on I-40 one day when I just had the little hooks on the side of your doors. Yeah, so we hit some high 20 miles per hour wind and my kayaks were like just surfing kites. They both went up, my rack came off my car and it was laying in the middle of I-40. This 18 wheeler had to stop traffic for me. I pulled them to the side, it was a hot mess. Let's just say it was pretty embarrassing. And thankfully there was no incidents or accidents from that taking place. So, um, so make sure that there is a safety strap that runs from those racks, unless they're bolt on. You know, uh, I have a car now that they actually bolt into the frame of your vehicle. So, um, so if you do have a car, car topping is great. Just look for a lighter kayak, um, you know, 50 or less than 100 pounds. You might have better biceps than I do, but um, look for those lighter kayaks, especially with the roof design of your car. It might only carry so much weight in the first place. So check that out too. But Sea to Summit pad sets are great. They also have those inexpensive foam pads like at Dick's Sporting Goods Academy where you can strap a canoe or kayak on top too. Uh, next, your bed extenders for your trucks. I have a truck now, thank goodness, because I broke my shoulder and truck is the way to go. Let me tell you that. So now I can just slide my kayak into the truck, but my truck bed is a short bed. It's only five feet long and my kayak is 12 feet long. So that's a lot of overhang that puts a lot of stress on the middle of that whole design of your kayak, especially if you hit a pothole or something. So you can go to, you know, H24 Outdoors, Academy Sports and get a bed extender. It looks like a big T that shoots off the back of your truck. It fits in your hitch. And you can uh, simply just strap the, you know, the other side of your kayak down to that bed extender. Really inexpensive way to tow if you do have a truck um, with a hitch. Um, the best thing would be a trailer, but, I don't know if y'all have ever been up to the Kings River. There's this one dirt road that you probably hit a three foot pothole full of water. It don't look that deep, but that's where I lost my bumper at on my car one time. But, um, you know, taking a trailer down that road, it can be challenging, especially turning and cutting and all that. But trailers are great, especially if you have a game and fish mark, you know, boat ramp, stuff like that. And obviously you can fit a lot more friends on a trailer than you can anything else. So those are some different examples, just toting a car. I'm trying to hit those pretty quickly, maybe I'm not. But um, I did see a question about shuttle services. The first thing I do when I go to a new area is I Google Caddo River, for example, uh, shuttle service. And usually there's some options that pop up and then I'll start calling, you know, what time they open, what time I need to be there. Now, if I go to a stream or creek that don't have a shuttle service, then, you know, you know I'll, i'm off on friday so it's hard for me to find someone that's off that same day so what i'll do is you know i'll hit up my dad i'll hit up some friends like hey you want to plan this trip two weeks out can you take off then what we do is take two vehicles we'll uh, load everything onto my truck or vice versa or a van you can have a van i put a 10-foot kayak in a van or an suv and we just load one vehicle down and then we left uh, the other vehicle at the takeout point and we drove everything up to the put in place with that one vehicle. Really inexpensive, you know, the Buffalo River, I love it, but you might drop 60 to $100 on shuttle services up there alone. And I wish I was kidding, but you know, it's far and few between, you know, dirt roads, long routes, you know, not to knock them down, but, you know, gas is expensive. So usually when you invite a friend or buddy, take two vehicles, leave one at the takeout, one at the put in. Um, but yeah, most of the time I'll text first, or not text, but Google search if there's a shuttle service in that area. Um, there's a lot of mom and pop places out there that don't rent kayaks, but they'll shuttle your vehicle for you for a small fee, like 25 bucks to 30 bucks. To me, that's worth it. Because, you know, $25 might spend 40, 50 bucks in gas getting up there versus just $25 for one vehicle and you can split with your friends. 
anyways, that, just a few examples. Uh, might have talked too fast or might have been super confusing, but that's some self-service, you know, things and how to tote your kayak or canoe. Uh, that's good add, information, Eric. I'm going to add one quick thing to what he was saying. Um, and I come from like the standpoint of sometimes it's harder for me to get, and I do, I have a truck and I put mine on top of my truck. Um, so I, and I'm a tall, I mean, I'm, I'm tall for, for a lady, but even then it's still hard for me to reach up there sometimes. So they actually make relatively cheap steps that you put in the, the door. I don't know how else to describe it, but you, they have them like an academy. You can Google them, but it's designed to hold the weight that give you an extra step. So you're not having, because before I had that, I was literally standing on the handle of the door and balancing on the window. And uh, one of these days I'm going to fall and break something. And I don't think they're going to count that as workman's comp. So, um, mm -hmm. That they do make so for those of you guys who are putting stuff on top of your vehicle there are actually steps that you can get that are fairly cheap that you can give you that extra boost to get up there to strap things down and all so no, that's good oh, Karen, thank you. You. oh sorry i will mention about the strap you know uh there's probably a visual thing out there or youtube it but a lot of people strap their kayaks wrong they don't dub double loop it maybe some of y'all know what double loop means but basically you want to put a horseshoe around your kayak on each side of the bar rack. If you don't do that, if you do a single line through there, it will move and it might blow off your car depending on how much movement. So definitely research proper strapping because um, it does make a huge difference, especially on high winds. Sorry. No, you're good. Darrell, what were you going to say? Uh, just a few additional points. Uh, Eric and Karen just, just doing a fabulous job. Um, first of all, Car topping, great points, Eric. Um, one of my canoes is an old town pack. It weighs 33 pounds, solo canoe, um, and can handle just about any water situation except for really tall standing waves and white water. If my, I can still handle that boat just fine and I throw it on top of my vehicles. That's my primary way of moving my boats around. Um, old town also makes a 45 pound version of a similar boat these days. Um, that actually has a kayak seat in it, but it's a small solo canoe. And you see a lot of hybrid boats like that now. Point being, fishing kayaks, boats that are made for fishing are actually pretty heavy. Um, there's some canoe applications or hybrid applications that are pretty lightweight and much easier to car top if you're locked into car topping. Um, straps is a great point. And I guess I'm just plugging some companies here NRS, Northwest River Supplies, makes the best canoe straps. I recommend those. I don't recommend anything else but those. And they come in all lengths. Like Eric said, you run that uh, under your crossbars, over your boat twice, if that boat's going nowhere. Uh, use them my whole life. Um, uh, and uh, lastly, um, when it comes to shuttling, if you're really adventurous and you're getting out to places your own or, or even with a buddy, um, but you just want to take one vehicle or you're limited to one vehicle and you've got no other options, um, look for rivers and creeks and situations where the shuttle is relatively short and there's a lot of those situations. You can carry your mountain bike, throw that in the bushes at the takeout, grab it, run back and get your vehicle. You can get pretty adventurous with it. Some people walk, run, um, so just keep in mind that you don't have to just rely on vehicles for shuttling. If you're of the health and uh, mindset of, uh, of doing otherwise. That's a great point. On Cricket Creek, there's a small little three mile float up there. And what I do is if I'm by myself, I'll go up there and I'll take a uh, backpack and I'll put all my important stuff, my GoPro cameras in that backpack, my wallet keys and stuff, and I'll just leave my boat there at the city park and um, I'll just walk back up and around. I mean, it's pretty hilly up there. <laughs> I was panting pretty hard, but we made it and it was really inexpensive and it is doable for sure. No, that's good points. Um, thank y'all very much. We're gonna jump into the Q and A. I think we got a lot of good information. We don't have a ton of questions in the chat yet, so please start going ahead and putting those in there. But the two questions that I have seen, um, has anybody used a foldable kayak? I've heard about them, but I have not used one. So if anybody's used one, Daryl, you have? Yeah. Um, again, there's so many 
crafts on the market these days, uh, just start Googling. Uh, it's amazing what's available. Inflatables, fold-ups, uh, there's so many. Um, uh, I recently had a friend, uh, I took a trip to West Virginia, went to the New River, stayed at a cabin, and a friend showed up and she had uh, a fold-up kayak mm -hmm. in her car. It was basically a nylon boat with a uh, uh, two inflatable tubes and some a light aluminum framing. It packed up and went in the back of her outback. Uh, it was some of the smallest mm -hmm. gear she had. And I fished all day on the New River out of that boat and just had a blast. Um, I can't remember the company name now, but I got back, looked on the internet, and that company makes a fishing application of a fold-up kayak. Um, and I actually want to get one. I've only got eight boats right now. I need to get another one. Um, <laughs> they're so cool because you can throw the thing in your trunk or your back seat or whatever. Um, and that was a really nice boat. So. Uh, I've had that one experience with a, a modern kayak. Hey, as long as it floats and it's compact, I think it's a, a viable option then. Uh, the other question was tips on getting kids started in kayak fishing, uh, namely probably things to avoid. So I'll, uh, Karen, I know you'll have plenty to say. Uh, no, somebody go ahead, yeah. Um, I started, uh, I, I have two daughters, they're 23 and 25 years old now, so they've survived a lot of river trips. Uh, I put each of them into their own kayak at 10 years old, and, and, and it's very important what Karen pointed out. Um, I'm trained by Arkansas Canoe Club in canoe classes uh, and uh, have had a lot of training. I was able to train my daughters on how to properly handle a sit on top kayak at 10 years old. And I had no worries and they've been excellent paddlers the whole time. So to, to get them kayak fishing, the obvious thing is gonna be put them on a lake first in, and, uh, and an easy to handle boat and get started with the fishing experience. But don't be afraid to move to the creek, but don't move to the creek unless you are gonna get proper paddle training for those kids. And I mean, do it first thing, right, Karen? Yeah, that, that was a good point about the, the kayak club classes. I put a link to that in the chat. I can throw another one in there if people need me to. But, uh, you know, that's a really good option. Eric, you had your hand up. I'll let you uh, jump in there real fast. Well, I have two kids, and I just bought um, my daughter. She's 10 now, her first kayak. And uh, one thing I was mentioned, you know, they want to be comfortable in the water, too. You know, you can go to Walmart and get one of those $90, $100 kayaks. You know, they don't have any uh, back seat to them whatsoever. It's just a hard plastic shell, which is great. But, um, you know, you can go to Academy Sports and Dicks and get one of those, uh, you know, little insert backs where you just uh, pad eye it down. You just attach it to that kayak itself. But, you know, what Karen mentioned earlier about lakes, I think it's real important to start them out in lakes. But, you know, here in central Arkansas, we're blessed with uh, Woolly Hollow. I'm not sure if a lot of y'all know about Woolly Hollow. No motors allowed on that boat. It's a really calm lake. It's protected by a lot of trees. So the wind's not too bad on there. So it's really calm, pretty little, short little paddle. that you can pay a small fee. I think it's $5 and it might be free. I can't remember. Anyways, you can just take them out there in that calm water, get them used to turning, doing their backstrokes. Backstrokes are just important as forward strokes, you know, and just getting their stability down. I think stability is the biggest thing. Get them comfortable, get that core used to, you know, leaning one way or the other. Um, that's the main thing with a lot of people, you know, adults too, is just balancing on them. You know, I, I go from a lot of kayaks, I've had 10 to 12, I can't remember now, and each of them, I have to go out and paddle it on a lake first, just get used to my rocker sides and all that my secondary stability and all that even though i've been kayaking for so long each boat's different each boat has different gives so the best thing is go in a shallow section on a lake where maybe they can stand up maybe you know off to the side of a buoy beach you know sometimes those beaches extend you can go past the buoys a little bit on the other side where the sand is just get them used to stability kind of walk around with them and paddle strokes and all that Perfect. Thank you. Karen, did you have anything to add on this? No, that, that hit exactly what I was going to say. So we're, we're great. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, get them comfortable with the paddling before we really get into too much fishing, at least so they're not afraid to fall out of the boat, um, for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Uh, now is the time to get them in there. 
while we're waiting on another question, uh, of course, I want to thank the panel for giving up time in their evening to put this on. Uh, I think we had a lot of great information and hopefully this was beneficial for everyone to be more comfortable. A few uh, hot tips on what to do, what not to do. And in the end, what we want is people to be comfortable, be safe and have a great experience so that they want to do it more. And, you know, it's something that they share with their friends and, and loved ones. So, um, how do you secure rods in the boat? Who wants it? I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm doing equipment. There you go. Take um, it. You know, there, there are several commercially made products. There are uh, kind of, uh, there's different, what they call rod leashes. Uh, I usually keep rod leashes on everything I don't currently have in my hand. Um, I have lost a rod or two because I, I have managed to uh, find a way to roll a boat while fighting a fish. Uh, you've got to, you know, eventually you have to uh, succumb to your safety <laughs> and maybe your fish runs off with your rod, which is a, a unfortunate experience, but I have done it. Um, I don't like fishing with a rod leash on. It kind of limits your, uh, it limits your mobility but I do keep them on everything I'm not currently using. Um, I take extra rods a lot of times. One of the things, if you, when you're purchasing a boat, one of the things that I look at is, can you break a rod down, put it in the hatch, and store it inside of the boat? If you have multiples of the same rod when you're going out, a lot of times it's a lot easier to secure one or two in your hole and have one or two that you're fishing with. Uh, to have some backup equipment. Um, one of my jobs at Game and Fish is uh, maintaining a, a huge number of rods. And I overspooled one of mine recently and was uh, went out and it took one rod with me. My fishing was done for the day after one mistake. Um, so it's good, it's good to make sure that you've got something either in your dry storage or that you, you keep them tethered. Um, and that goes back to what I was talking about earlier with equipment. Make sure for the type of water you're running, you're, you're storing your rods properly. Are you keeping them out of the trees or uh, out of the, uh, you know, if you're if you're navigating a whole lot of rocks and everything, are they secured to the boat? So that that's my that's my two cents on that one. Perfect. We got another back question. To kids, hey, back to the question about kids earlier. I had a little input on that with my kids. Uh, when you start fishing, I'm a gear junkie. I've raised one out of two that's a gear junkie. Limit what they take with them. Don't, don't, don't let them just inundate the boat with too many things. You know, yeah. I, I try and we, we, when we go, there's typically three of us. We have multiple coolers. We, everybody's got their own lunch. Everybody's got whatever, but it's like, don't, don't let them, you know, get too much gear in the boat. Uh, I have a lot, I have a lot bigger boat that I keep. Um, I run a, I run a pretty good size rig. Uh, I try and keep them to very being very minimalist in their gear selection. That way it's, it's simpler. Yeah. We that's can, a good and, you know, when we started fishing, we would do more fishing stopped than we did going on. We'd go find a good piece of water. Everybody stop, get out, really fish a good uh, fish, that piece of water hard. That way, if they need any assistance, I'm there. Yeah. So. Thank you, sir. Um, we have a question about a cheap fish finder. Is it, uh, is it a good idea or is it a waste of money? Does anybody have a fish finder on their, on their rig? I figured Eric might, so go for it. Um, with fish finders, I've owned from the cheapest of the cheap into the most expensive. Uh, first of all, what I look for, the, the best way, the easiest to read is a down scan. Um, you know, a lot of people get confused with traditional sonars where you see all the different colors and stuff like that. 
But what I like to do, you can go to Bass Pro Shop, uh, Lawrence, Garmin, each have a unit. And I think they're around $100 to $150, really inexpensive. You don't need a fancy battery. You can use a deer feeder battery to run them. You don't, you know, a 12 volt battery. So you can go to Bass Pro Shop and they're, if you look on their website, just, you know, cheap fish finders, for example, it'll bring up, you know, those two fish finders. I just can't remember. I think it's Clearview is what they call it. But um, they're one of the best and they're highly recommended. Tons of reviews on them, four stars, five stars, and they're really inexpensive. But what I would look, don't get just a traditional sonar with just the reds and the blues because it's hard to pick up on what's structure, what's not, what's fish and what's not. So if you run that traditional sonar next to a down scan sonar, usually you'll do a split screen. It will break down that image a lot better in down scan and you'll have a clear view exactly what you're seeing. So I highly recommend it's 150 or less at Bass Pro Shop. You can go online if you're not near a Bass Pro Shop and just look for one of those. Um, and for me, I don't take my fish finder on rivers and creeks. You know, with most of the rivers I go over, they're going to be boulders. I don't want to drag that transducer over through the rapids. I mean, you can make it where it swivels up, swivels down, but that gets annoying on Cajun Creek when you're constantly doing that. Now, you know, when I get to a big hole, I'm just going to drag a Ned rig on the bottom or a worm and just, you know, so rivers and creeks, you can pretty much get by without having fish finder ever just because you can see the structure visibly and you don't really need one. Now, when it comes to lake fishing, if you're a crappie fisherman, I think you do need a fish finder, you know, to find those brush piles, find those secondary points, those, you know, first points on those lakes. Um, you know, a lot of people will go fish shallow. You know, if you go to Lake Conway, for example, you wouldn't really need a fish finder. You just hit the cypress trees, you know, see any structure you see. But these deeper lakes like Grizz Ferry Lake, you know, uh, Washita, all that, you might want to look for some brush piles on some points, main lake points and stuff like that. So, you know, for me, I don't take a fish finder on rivers and creeks, but for lake fishing, that's usually when I take my fish finder out with me to try to find those brush piles, depending on the species I'm fishing for, or, you know, rocks, anything like that. So that's my opinion anyways. I appreciate it. Um, all right, I think we got our last question and it is about outriggers for a kayak. Anybody want to tackle that? Go for it. I mean, if, if Eric, you've uh, well, got Eric, the, talk the a lot. I've experienced a lot too. There's a, uh, with outriggers, you can purchase some. They are pretty expensive or you can, I'm all about the DIY projects. I have a DIY live well project on my YouTube channel where I used a cat food um, tank well and put a, you know, bilge pump in it and I have a crappie, you know, live well. You can go get the Hobie one for $300 or you can make your own for 60. So I'm all about DIY projects as long as they're going to work. But, you know, there's a, if you just Google YouTube, there's so much good information on YouTube about, you know, DIY outriggers. But to me, I've never had to use them. Um, I've used them once or twice. I had a trolling motor, shame to say it, on my kayak. Uh, one of the best inexpensive kayaks out there on the market, super stable. I'm six foot, 240. And so I'm a, you know, a big guy, I'm not a tall guy, but, um, and Old Town Vapor 10 was one of my favorite kayaks I've ever owned. Now, uh, when I put that trolling motor on that kayak, I was ripping around Lake Connor, which was kind of sketch, you know, it's just a trunk mine or, a, you know, a tree trunk mine out there. But I did put an outrigger off to the side just to give me a secondary stability, especially when I was turning real sharp. So I wouldn't overdo it. Um, but most of your kayaks these days, especially your fishing specific kayaks, you don't really need them um, depending on the width. So when you're breaking down a new kayak, look for a certain width, um, 30, 30 inches, 32, you know, if you're going in the 29 or lower then yeah, if you're going out in the ocean hitting the surf, yeah, you might need some outriggers. Um, but most of the time I don't um, take them just because they do kind of get in the way, you know, as far as, uh, you know, fishing, you might hook one, you might wrap something into it. Your paddle stroke is going to be shortened. You're not going to get that long stroke. You're going to be bumping those riggers a lot. So, I mean, if you have a narrow kayak right now and you're trying to add more stability to it, um, you know, you can definitely do some core strengthening activities where you rock and roll a little bit on the lake, you know, try to get used to that, you know, stability. 
but yeah, you can't add that in there, but um, there's plenty of designs on there and they do improve stability. I mean, you can stand with them and all that for sure, but they are a great if you do need them, if you need extra stability for sure. Thank you, sir. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat. So uh, we've done this for a little over an hour and 15. I want to respect everybody's time. I do appreciate everybody being here tonight, uh, our guests and our panel. So uh, thank you all. We will be doing another one of these in a couple of months. There will be a follow-up email coming out with lots of links, things like that, contact information for for our panelists, if you've got any questions, please just let us know and we'd be happy to answer them for you. So uh, thank you all for being here. Y'all have a great night.